I recently felt compelled to leave this note on the car of a woman who almost plowed into us in an intersection on our way to the grocery store because she was too busy on her phone to be bothered to drive the two-ton death machine she was about to let plow right into us because she wasn't paying attention. And that's something that happens pretty much on a weekly basis anymore, that we have to try and avoid people who cannot drive their car because they have to be on the phone possibly killing themselves or killing us. People are becoming so attached to their smartphones that you can barely find a person who will leave the house without one anymore. The average person now touches their smartphone display over 2,600 times a day. Probably more than anything else they touch at all. Studies have found that nearly half of all people who own one use it for an alarm clock, too, so they're sleeping with an EMF-admitting device, which even the World Health Organization has now classified as possibly carcinogenic, right in their bedroom, in some cases, right next to their pillow on a bedside stand, or even under it. An Alabama man was almost electrocuted while sleeping with his iPhone or his phone in general charging in his bed. Our whole society is being edited around having a smartphone now. Signs have been put up at college campuses to remind students to look up. That's a thing. That exists now. And the Department of Transportation, and probably every state in this country, are constantly putting up signs on the side of highways reminding people if they text and drive, they could likely kill themselves or someone else. We got a text. It's from that cute guy, Patrick. Look. Ooh, la la. It is to the point now that movie theaters like AMC are talking about changing their policy to allow smartphones to be on and be used during films, even though the entire point of going to the movie is supposed to be to actually watch the freaking movie. And as I've mentioned many times before, because it still blows my mind, certain countries are installing special smartphone user sidewalks to try and keep people who can't even afford to pay attention while walking outside near traffic from being turned into street pizza. We aren't programming this technology anymore, you guys. It's programming us. It is rewiring us to require a near constant electrostimulus. So here are just five examples of how this is, is changing us, rewiring us, engineering us. First, you have the rise of the constant checker. You've seen these people in public, I guarantee it. It's the person that even when they set their phone down, say at the table or something like that at a restaurant while they're eating, they still have to continuously touch it anyway, even if they're not actually looking at it. Studies have shown that 43% of people in America, and I'm sure this trend probably holds for developed nations, are considered constant checkers, which is probably on the increase. People who constantly, obsessively have to check their phone, their email, their Facebook, their Twitter, their Instagram, their text, online news sites, whatever it is, they cannot live a normal life anymore without their phone with them all the time. Studies on these people actually show they have a significantly higher level of stress than people who don't do this to themselves, with over 40% of them realizing that they're basically addicted to the stimuli and that it might have a negative effect on their physical and mental health, but they continue to do it anyways because they just cannot help it. Then this just came out, Brain Drain, a study that showed that the mere presence of a smartphone in a room doesn't even have to be, you don't even have to be using it. Just having it in the room for a large number of people actually reduces cognitive capacity just by being in the room. So don't even have to be on the phone, but just the fact that what they called an attractive high priority stimuli like the smartphone being there in the room is enough to drain mental resources for a lot of people. And how they figured this out was they had college students, they put them in a room, and some of them had the phone in the room with them either on a desk or in a bag or in a pocket. And then they had them do math problems and they had another group of college students and they put the smartphone in another room entirely. And the students who had their phone in the other room did significantly better on the test. It was simple math problems. It wasn't hard stuff. But what they also found on the test is that people who had the phone in the room answered that they thought the phone being there had no effect on them, which also shows a contrast between what people think and the actual reality. And speaking of an effect on reality, Twitter rumors have caused everything from a run on the banks in Kazakhstan to the fact that Facebook has now been referred to as the best human research lab ever. And as Kashmir Hill of Forbes points out, there's no need to get experiment participants to sign pesky consent forms as they've already agreed to Facebook's data use policy. A team of Facebook data scientists are constantly coming up with new ways to study human behavior 
through the social network. And I know I've pointed this out in videos before, but I think it's so important. And considering now that Facebook has just hit an average of 2 billion users per month, it bears repeating that in 2002, Facebook ran a random experiment on nearly 700,000 users for a week, where they would show them either positive, happy stuff in their feeds or negative, depressing stuff in their feeds. And what do you know? The people with the happy feeds posted happy posts, and the people with the negative stuff tended to post angry, depressing stuff. So it isn't just that people are addicted to checking it every other five minutes, but Facebook has proven with quite a large sample group for any psychological research study that it can manipulate people's emotions. They have that power, and now they've got 2 billion users a month with which to do it. I also read, and unbelievably, but I guess this is where we're at, that researchers at Burbeck University of London and King's College London say that three quarters of all UK toddlers, that's children between the age of six months and three years old, now use iPads or smartphones every day. I, six month olds using iP iPads every day. I mean, just that's what's going on. And I don't know how many times I've personally seen this, but we'll be sitting down to dinner at a restaurant and a mother will come in, plunk her small kid down, and immediately prop up an iPad right in front of his face and then pull out her phone. They don't talk to each other. They don't look at each other. If the kid tries to get his mom's attention, maybe show her something happening in the cartoon or whatever that she's turned on to distract him, she won't even look because she's too concerned with checking Instagram or whatever on her phone to even give her own kid the time of day. Parents are admittedly ignoring their children, and the children are learning to ignore everyone else because of it. And studies are showing that smartphone-addicted parents have more negative interactions with their children when they do interact with their children. But is all of it having physical consequences, too? A new study out of the University of California, Irvine, says devoting more attention to your smartphones than your children could mean they'll have improper brain development and emotional disorders later in life. And that's certainly what's being suggested by the fact that social skills have now eroded to the point that college students are having to take etiquette classes to try and relearn even the basics on how to physically interact with people in real life. And experts are even warning that children spending all their time on these kinds of devices are showing a startling lack of ability not only to read other people's emotions, but a lack of being able to show empathy. Kind of like little robots, which kind of makes you wonder what it's going to look like in another few generations of this, actually. And then finally, I know I've mentioned this before, but Microsoft Canada came out with a study a few years back, which showed that the human attention span has shrunk overall from 12 seconds in the year 2000 to 8 seconds in 2013, which the tech giant noted is one second shorter than the attention span of the average goldfish. And I went and got the study and read it. And it was actually written by Microsoft to its corporate customer base to show how they could advertise things to people in a world where technology is decreasing everyone's ability to pay attention long enough to even care about what's in an ad. And of course, Microsoft did what it could to put a positive spin on all of this. But after reading through it, not only is it obvious they're talking about human beings as if we are now mere computers, but it's also pretty evident to me that the technology is definitely programming the people more than the people are programming it. The thing has creepy lines like, It's no surprise that increased media consumption and digital lifestyles reduce the ability for consumers to focus for extended periods of time. But I never would have guessed that tech-savvy consumers are getting better at processing information and encoding that information to memory. If there's no need to stay tuned in, why not move on to the next new and exciting thing for another hit of dopamine? Yeah. So we're not only being completely removed from actual reality, but now we're becoming these little techno junkies that are just looking out for that next hit of dopamine. That's how they discuss us. Like little human biological android programmable computers that are just down to where can we get our next hit of stimulus. Someone on a video we did just a little while back left a comment that it's getting to the point where the majority of everyone can't even remember what they did last week anymore. So when you add all that together and really think about it, who could argue that the zombie apocalypse isn't already here? But this problem has reached a level now where people are actually doing what's called a digital detox. And companies are providing this where they will take you somewhere and make sure you're not allowed to have your phone. 
but you go somewhere for several days without any devices, no phones, no tablets, no computers, no TV, nothing, which used to just be the way people lived anyway, just saying. <laughs> but these days, that's considered radical. Studies on these people show that they physically start interacting with each other differently when they don't have their phone. Not only are they not Googling everything, for one thing, they actually have to use their own brain to, to figure things out. But for two, they actually start making more eye contact with each other. They sit more upright. They become more physically involved in the conversation. They become more present in the real world. Every single one of these people is on their phone. <laughs> just challenge everybody to ask yourselves when the last time was you just went up to the grocery store without your phone. I mean, I've asked a people in my own life when the last time they tried it. And what I hear all the time from people is, what if something happens? I lived on this planet for two decades without a cell phone and hardly ever did something happen that I had to know what that was while I'm trying to buy broccoli or something? Or did I have to be interrupted with beeps and texts and calls while I'm trying to just buy some food, which is a basic thing you need to survive? Most likely what'll happen is you won't bump your cart into someone else you didn't see because you weren't paying attention while you're supposed to be grocery shopping. The world is not gonna explode if you don't have a phone. I know my inbox looks like a nightmare from hell, but I really don't care. I cannot allow myself to be a slave to these things. Sometimes you just have to turn it off, go outside, ground yourself, stare at a tree, as my dad used to say. We don't have to become dehumanized, programmed biological androids who only know how to interact with each other through a technological medium and who are just looking for that next hit of electro-stimulus dopamine. We don't have to be dehumanized down to that level by our technology. As technology advances, it's going to begin encroaching on us more and more and ultimately invading our bodies and our brains. But we don't have to give up our humanity. But looking around, I'm just really worried that a lot of people will. <laughs>